What is taking the life of tens of thousands of people every week but could be prevented? But first, can Christians learn to disagree agreeably? And it's great to discuss things. That's a good thing. It's when people start calling names and tempers flare, and that's, that's not the way that we're supposed to handle things. And uh, we have that kind of attitude. And I, th- I think we need just to step back, especially on peripheral issues, on issues that we can have disagreement about. And yet we're still part of the body of Christ. If I'm going to spend eternity with, with mm. uh, people in heaven, I shouldn't be treating them as if they're second class citizens here on earth. This is Understanding the Times Radio with Jan Markell. As we begin today's program, Jan is joined by her two co-hosts, Eric Barger and Jill martin Rishi, to discuss how to disagree agreeably. And later in this broadcast, filmmaker and apologist Ray Comfort will be here to preview a new video he's released on the theme of suicide under the title Exit. We begin with Jan Markell. And several who are a part of this ministry have uh, spoken out over the past years about a tone in the world of ministry, a tone uh, one can sense in the world even of social media that is, I think, not pleasing to the Lord. It says in Second Timothy 2 that believers are to not be quarrelsome, but to be kind, patiently enduring evil and correcting opponents with gentleness. And I'm not seeing a whole lot of gentleness in the world of ministry. Just the opposite, in fact. And two who have spoken out on this beyond myself are in studio with me, and they often serve as radio co-hosts, Eric Barger and Joel Martin Rishi. And I recently wrote on this an article which is on my website titled Contentious Contending for the Faith. Eric Barger has written on it, When Discernment Turns Ugly, and Jill manages our social media. Jill, let me just start with you here by way of convenience, because you're on social media Olive Tree Ministry social media every day, many times a day. And are you sensing some contention between those who are dialoguing with each other? Oh, absolutely. Social media can be one of the most dangerous places to be at, I think. And uh, people get very passionate about things. And that's fine. Being passionate about something is not bad. What happens is when you step over that line and start attacking other people, that's the big problem. And that's certainly not biblical. What are some issues that would cause the attacking differences in doctrine and then differences in peripheral issues peripheral yeah and things like eschatology you know we have a lot of people going head to head on pre-trib versus post-trib and it's great to discuss things that's a good thing it's when people start calling names and tempers flare and that's that's not the way that we're supposed to handle things the three of us have talked about this on air before this is sort of coming back to revisit a topic that sadly we have to keep revisiting which is very tragic I have watched mean-spiritedness coming from Christian leaders that, quite frankly, I think would make the secular world blush, but it's coming from fellow Christians. And you could say it's friendly fire that isn't so friendly. And if I were to publicly chastise some of these people and name their names, they would reply with even more vindictive blogs, radio programs, articles, commentaries, YouTubes. They can dish out the chastisement, but they cannot take an ounce of correction. And uh, Eric, you've written on this, and you wrote a tremendous, I'm going to quote a little bit from your article, When Discernment Turns Ugly. So Mm -hmm. obviously you have noticed this as well. Absolutely. Not just in in ministry leaders, but I see the same thing being replicated in the rank-and-file Christian as well. The, I don't know if we can say this is a fulfillment in any way, but, you know, the Bible does talk about the love of many growing mm-hmm. cold, but we see the tone of the world now transferring into the church and the way we, we seem to just want to shout down somebody we disagree with rather than want to dialogue. And I'm thinking of a, a phone message I got from somebody who disagreed with me on my TV telecast where we talked about the, the book, The Shack, and it started out with the most vile language, and then this person mm-hmm. And identifies himself as a believer. I'm talking yeah. about language. I don't even want to tell you what it, I can't even begin to tell you. Mm-hmm. But I'm thinking this is the way we now talk to one another. This is the way we dialogue. This is the way we disagree. We have to use those kind of, of tactics and language and so on. That's is so anti-biblical. It's not even funny, but it's not funny at all. You know what I mean? Yeah. Well, you write, Eric, and, and this is this article you wrote a few years ago now, When Discernment Turns Ugly, you write, you say both Jan and I have become increasingly uncomfortable even just 
disturbed with the tone and lack of civility being portrayed by some within the apologetics and discernment community of speakers, writers, commentators. We've watched, listened, and have tried to intervene as assorted discernment ministries have fired shots at others inside Christianity over issues that fall miserably short of what has always been considered heresy. And then you say, Eric, a troubling precedent has been spawned by some lending validation to the idea that it's perfectly acceptable to publicly rake anyone over the coals for nearly any theological reason. And you conclude, Jan and I are not alone in our dismay with what's happening. Other leaders have voiced the same concern to us in recent days. And mind you, the issue is not concerning any rejection of the virgin birth or the bodily resurrection of Christ, nor is it related to pseudo-Christian yet cultic emergent heresy or the seducing web with which spiritual liberalism ensnares so many. And you go on to say that disagreements on secondary doctrine, styles of worship, and peripheral practices. What does your father, Dr. Walter Martin, say about disagreements? He says that the Bible teaches very clearly that there are obedient sheep and disobedient sheep. And that means that some of us, and I know I've been guilty of this in the past, some of us can get off on subjects or off onto saying things in certain subjects that are not loving and that really step outside the bounds of obedience, which is what? Love one another as Mm -hmm. I have loved you. So there are disobedient sheep. They can be guilty of being unloving. They can be guilty of being cruel. They can be guilty of many different things. And we are supposed to stop, step back and say, look, you are not speaking the way you should to a Christian brother. You are not responding the way you should be responding to someone who is part of the body of Christ. This is a question of disobedience and repentance is needed. Well, I mean, we are in a day of raging apostasy. I mean, we all acknowledge that. And true heresy needs to be called out, I think. It seems today's apologetics crowd, I mean, they're just waiting for a a leader to make a single misstep. And it can be as simple as a a sentence that is stated in the wrong way. And that person is going to be pounced on as a hopeless heretic. He's going to be marginalized by that community. And if any of us associate or feature them or quote them or publicly show approval, then we have lost all our discernment and judgment as well. It's easy for people to point the finger. Very easy to point at someone else and say, you've done this wrong or you've done that wrong. Yeah, it really is. The internet has made it so easy to be anonymous as you mm-hmm. do it. And, and people just, right. they feel disconnected because they're not looking somebody in the face. In fact, so much that's written and spoken through the internet would never be said face to face with with somebody you disagreed with, but uh, I think in the Greek that's called snarky. I'm I'm teasing folks, but <laughs> but that's what happens, and uh, we have that kind of attitude. And I, th- I think we need just to step back, especially on peripheral issues, on issues that we can have disagreement about, and yet we're still part of the body of Christ. If I'm going to spend eternity with with mm. uh, people in heaven, I shouldn't be treating them as if they're second class citizens here on earth. Christians get so upset at the way the news media responds. Mm. They say, you know, you. You don't give us such, you know, you're you're taking things and blowing them out of proportion. You're lying about things. You're misrepresenting us. Okay, we get upset about that. But yet there are many who turn around and do the same thing in the Christian world. And what is that, you know, but hypocrisy? We need to look at what we are saying, weigh it in the balance of is this love? Is this truth? And respond accordingly, not attack respond. You're listening to Understanding the Times Radio. I'm Jen Markell. I have in the studio two who often share this programming with me, Eric Barger and Jill Martin Rishi. And I want to go back to an incident that caused me to write this article on contentious contending for the faith. And I'm going to get a little bit specific here. And I think everyone here is aware of it because recently I was made aware of an entire YouTube had been made, actually was denouncing me personally for some association I had with Pastor J.D. Farag, Calvary Chapel, Kaneohe, Hawaii. And he was being attacked for all sorts of things. He was being insulted. It was it was almost, it was so painful to watch and it was so uncalled for because I'm honored to be working with Pastor J.D. He's a humble servant who has love for Bible prophecy. He's part of the Calvary Chapel movement. He has an Arab heritage and he has a special love for Israel and the Jewish people in spite of his Arab heritage. So I was saddened to see some YouTubes made against him attacking his very character. And in the same video over a disagreement, get this, over two verses. 
two verses in Scripture caused an hour-long video to be made denouncing Pastor Farag. And honestly, and I think, Eric, the thing that's a little bit concerning to all of us is uh, an unbeliever watching some of this would probably flee our camp and hang out with his drinking buddies because they might treat him better than he sees Christians treating Christians. Some of those who have decided to take the tack that we are concerned about would say, but I'm defending the faith and I, I'm, mm-hmm. I'm looking out for the sheep. So that's the other side of that coin. But we're running the people away as well. We're running people away from the cross. We're running people yeah. away from receiving the, the word of God and evangelism. I mean, yes. that's, that's part of the price that's being paid here. So I've pleaded now for years, as you well know, and this has been the platform that obviously I've done it on with radio and you and, and Jill. We need to take a step back and we need to recognize where we are in time. Yes, there's going to be heresies. Yes, there's going to be more apostasy going on in the days ahead than we've ever seen before. But let's be careful how we treat each other at the same time. Let's unite together under the banner of the blood of Jesus Christ. And remember that we're trying to get through to a lost and dying world. We are the only chance Mm -hmm. they have, if you will. Now, I know that God can use many means, but he's decided to use the mouths of people to give his word. And so we we need to remember that we have a responsibility to make sure that we preach the gospel and that nothing impedes that and gets in the way. And that's what the fear is. Yes, I agree completely, Eric. And here's the thing, okay, in this kind of a world where we are being attacked all around outside of us, and let's face it, the climate in America today is getting Mm -hmm. pretty dangerous. So can we really afford to sit around shooting at each other? Anyone who does that is not going to be successful in fighting what's coming at you. We have to be ready for spiritual warfare. We have to be ready for what's coming at us. And we don't have time to sit on the sidelines shooting at each other. So we need to look at the larger perspective, the bigger perspective. Do what God has called us to do, defend the faith, spread the gospel, and stop fighting with each other. It's become vogue to uh, to shoot at other apologists to make yourself the only one that's trustworthy in the eyes of a few who are following you. And uh, right. I don't want a following if that's what it takes. Some people become slaves to their blog stats. Yeah, <laughs> Their blog yeah. stats start climbing really high when they attack others mm. in the body. That's right. That's right. And when they focus on peripheral issues. And I, you know, I'm sorry, but that is a trap that a lot of people fall into. When you start seeing thousands of people dropping by your blog to hear you say what you're going to say, because controversy mm-hmm. causes a lot of interest, mm-hmm. you know, then you, you become you know, vulnerable to an ego thing and a pattern of behavior of attacking. And that is what is so sad. Well, Eric, you write, again, I'm referring to this article. I wrote one called Contentious Contending for the Faith. In it, I quoted Eric's article, When Discernment Turns Ugly. You can find When Discernment Turns Ugly at ericbarger.com. ericbarger.com. You can find mine at olivetreeviews.org, olivetreeviews.org. And Eric, you write, and since most people aren't sitting in front of a computer, let me just read another paragraph here. You ask, is biblical apologetics about denigrating others and in effect besmirching entire ministries based on disagreements about side issues? For some, this is what it's become. And worse, the field of discernment has at least in part become a hotbed of separatism that seems to far exceed biblical standards. And then you go on to say, from what is sometimes only one one pen or keyboard, judgment is meted out against the suspected offender as newsletters are printed, blogs are published, seminars are given, and whole ministries and reputations are possibly done irreversible harm. All this takes place no matter how flimsy the evidence presented may be, and often over non-essential theologies. This should disgust the Christian community, and I fear for the next generation of apologists and those they'll like influence who are being schooled by this example. Let me comment here because, Eric, you say this should discuss the Christian community, and I think it does discuss plenty of people, but as we've already suggested, this seems to flourish in the Christian community. As Jill said, stats go up. The, seems to be the more the more brutal you are, the more your likes are going to go up and your views are going to go up, and I find this really troubling. 
it used to be in pastors' meetings, we'd hear pastors discuss in a very casual way, well, you know, how many do you have in Sunday school, and how many did you baptize, and you hear those things. Now it's, how many views did you get on YouTube, mm-hmm. you know, so and true. sadly, that's the way it, it's working, and, yeah. and I, I'll admit, I'm excited when I see that people are watching my stuff or reading my articles, but that's that can't be my motivation, that I become more provocative all the time and do damage to my brother and the Lord at the same time. Well, there are disobedient sheep. There are obedient and disobedient. When you get into disagreements, uh, you can fall into the category of being a disobedient sheep, which is one that I would really like to avoid, if at all possible. So what do you do? You look at those sheep that you believe are being disobedient, being unloving, and you say, you know what? We're not supposed to be addressing each other this way. We're not supposed to be causing division. So if you are going to continue in this vein, I'm not going to come here and read it. That has to be the attitude that people need to take. If you are causing division, if you are speaking most of the time in anger, frustration, and and the attack mode, Mm -hmm. then I believe you've fallen into the category of disobedient sheep and you need to be treated as such, avoided, period. Let's give a little plug for our social media, Jill, the Twitter and the Facebook. We are very busy on Facebook. I love talking to you. If you come and speak with us on Facebook, Jan drops in. We talk about all kinds of Mm -hmm. different subjects. And to all of our Facebook listeners out there, I want to say how much I enjoy Enjoy your comments. I wish I could list all of your names. I read you every day and I'm listening to what you are saying. And it really is a joy to watch really great discussions happen. I would say the vast majority of the discussions on our Facebook are pretty nice. People are kind to each other. Tell them how to access it. You can just look up Jan Markell's Olive Tree Ministries on Facebook and you will find us right away. And Twitter. Same with Twitter, Jan Markell. Eric, why don't you kind of wrap this up? Again, I played heavily off your article, which is one of the best, When Discernment Turns Ugly. And we've covered this on air before, two, three years ago. And we were back then watching ministry. And it's just gotten worse. Every year it gets worse instead of better. And one of us used the the reference of love growing cold. And it seems that that's sort of what's happened just at the time when we need to be just the opposite. Love seems to be growing cold. And this kind of hostility is coming out. This almost, I'm going to use the word vengeance. It's just really, it's its just stunning. Yeah, let us not act like the secular news media. Let us not treat one another this way. My first and foremost, my heart cry about mm-hmm. this, as I've already stated, is for the lost who yeah. are going to be affected. And we're spending time doing, you know, this kind of stuff that's about a peripheral issue instead of how can we go and reach our neighbor, our loved ones, friends, whoever, the lost guy on the street, whoever it might be that, that we have the opportunity to reach. Instead of doing that, we're doing the other business it's hurting one another. But secondly, as you read from the article, and I've said this over and over on air here, I'm concerned about the next generation Mm -hmm. of apologists who will think this is a way to do business, and it's not. And that concerns me. And I pray that each of us would recognize we need to take a hard line against apostasy. But I I think there's a difference between, by the way, apostasy and error. Let's be careful here. Mm -hmm. Apostasy is one thing. We can believe somebody might be in error on something, but if it's in a peripheral issue, a doctrine that doesn't Mm -hmm mean somebody goes to heaven or hell, let's be careful about the way we treat them. We we don't beat them over the head like they're a, a heretic if we just disagree with someone and we think they're wrong on an issue. I mean, we could go on and on restating the same thing, but if there's any two things, it's for the lost, and secondly, okay. it's for what happens next in our field of ministry. Well, you want to continue the discussion, you can do so through olivetreeviews.org. You can reach Eric at ericbarger.com, ericbarger.com. You can discuss and dialogue with Jill at Walter Martin. Martin.com, WalterMartin.com, or just join our social media, our Facebook, Jan Markell's Olive Tree Ministries, or our Twitter, Olive Tree Men, which Jill manages on a daily basis. I want to thank you both for coming in studio and dialoguing with us, with me a little bit today. We're changing topics. Next segment. Thank you for joining us for today's edition of Understanding the Times. Coming up, Ray Comfort. Ray will join Jan for our next two segments to discuss the issue of suicide. Just four weeks ago, our annual Fall Understanding the Times conference was held in Metro Minneapolis. If you weren't able to attend that weekend event in person, we think you'll want to own those conference messages as recorded on DVD or compact disc. Our conference speakers drilled down into our culture and our times. They brought us some of the best insights into current events as they relate to God's Word. Order 2017 conference memories online at olivetreeviews.org 
or when you phone 763-559-4444. The speakers have been fantastic. I just, it is so relevant for now. It gets me just so excited about what's happening and just so excited about all the knowledge that's being displayed here. And just, you know, we're just not hearing that kind of truth in the churches. But I'm just saying as a rule, we're, we're seeing a lot of churches tickling ears and not speaking truth. And I'm hearing it here. And I think the volume of people here with every room filled speaks volumes of what Jan's truths are, which are the Bible. They're speaking the truth. And I love it. Amen. Stay with us for a special announcement on our recent conference. Jan will return with Ray Comfort right after this. Our recent Understanding the Times conference brought great clarification to the many issues of the day we are watching in daily headlines. They will only make sense when interpreted from the Bible. Our times are perilous. The church is caving to apostasy. America cannot be found in biblical prophecy. Europe is preparing for the Antichrist. But the good news is that Jesus Christ will return for his bride very soon. Our speakers included Amir Sarfati. The Antichrist has to be a good friend of Israel, has to serve the interests of the people of Israel and the Jewish people, has to be liked by them to the point of even worshipped by them. Pastor J.D. Farag. The clarion call is to know that not only are we living in the last moments of world history as we know it, but we need to know what to do while there's still time. Dr. Mark Hitchcock. The enemy is working feverishly today in seminaries, denominations, and churches to pry people away from trust in the inerrant, inspired, living Word of God. And apostasy is an inside job. Michelle Bachman. The final judgment over Babel goes hand in hand with the second coming of Jesus Christ, the Messiah, and the dawn of the messianic time, which will be centered on Zion. Why not order complete sets of CDs and DVDs today. Five messages are offered on DVD for just $35 plus $5 shipping in the U.S. Five messages are offered on CD for $30 plus $5 shipping in the U.S. DVDs contain valuable speaker PowerPoint. Order online at olivetreeviews.org, olivetreeviews.org, or call us at 763-559-4444. 763-559-4444. You can also write to us at Box 1452, Maple Grove, Minnesota, 55311. Box 1452, Maple Grove, Minnesota, 55311. The government released new statistics about suicide in the U.S., and the results were sobering and stunning. The nation's suicide rate is at its highest point since 1986. Nearly 43,000 people ended their own lives in 2014, which is the most recent year with full data. Welcome back to Understanding the Times. In our next two segments, Jan meets with Ray Comfort to review and preview Ray's new video project on the subject of suicide. For those who don't know, Ray Comfort is a New Zealand-born Christian minister and evangelist. Comfort began Living Waters Publications and The Way of the Master out of Bellflower, California. He's written over 80 books. Now, let's get the conversation started with Ray Comfort. Again, here's Jan Markell. And welcome back. And I'm going to spend the next couple of segments talking about, well, it's a sensitive issue, particularly if it has affected you or could in the future, because millions of people suffer from depression and millions think about suicide. Suicide is the second leading cause of death in college age kids. A half a million are taken to the hospital yearly with suicide attempts. And LifeWay Research says that one in three churchgoers are affected by suicide. So those of you listening right now and 
sort of uh, brushing aside this topic as irrelevant, please, please think again. I'd like to welcome back a guest I've not had on here recently, but he makes some of the most tremendous and thought-provoking films. He's got a relatively new film out right now on the topic of suicide. Ray Comfort, welcome back to the program. Well, thank you for having me on. I appreciate it. Ray, Lifeway Research article states that few people turn to the church for help before they take their own lives. And I think this this fact alone is tragic. So what kind of a message is the church sending that people struggling with thoughts about taking their own life, etc., uh, perhaps would not even think of turning to a pastor or a church worker for help? Well, that's a really good question. You know, many of our church leaders, our high-profile preachers, have become nothing but motivational speakers. They're not sons of thunder preaching righteousness in the great congregation. They don't preach about sin or the fear of the Lord or righteousness or judgment to come. And consequently, Jesus said, when that sort of thing happens, we become good for nothing when we lose our salty influence as the church the government should be coming to us for moral mm. direction and they've lost respect for us because we, we're no different than the world our message is no different than the world and so another virtue of the church is not only uh, salt but light and we're in darkness as a nation yeah. we're in gross darkness and now more than ever before we need to be like uh, John the Baptist an uncompromising burning and shining light so the world are attracted to us and say look we've come to you for direction we don't know what to do we're in darkness and if there's anything that's dark, it's the whole subject of suicide. And so uh, that's why we made this movie, to yeah. give some light on this terrible subject. Well, and you suggest, rightly so, and by the way, I have this problem of depression in my family, so I, I'm painfully aware of it all, but you suggest uh, that shame is often attached to this, and, and, and very often this is all called mental illness. Some of it is, of course, and Christians actually can have mental illness, but there are some out there who will only attach shame shame to what we're talking about, and I think that that really complicates the issue. Would I be right? Yeah, you know, I, I'm not a big fan of it being called a mental illness, because according to the World Health Organization, 350 million people right. suffer from depression, which, does that mean they're all mentally ill? I think it's more than that. I think, I think billions of people suffer from depression. Very few people go through this life without battling depression, because there are a lot of things to be oppressed, depressed about. There's not only the economy, there's just every, every area you look, there's just depressing things going on. People dying every day and, and things that, that pull us down. And even as a, as a Christian, I get depressed and sometimes yeah. I get depressed for no reason. And only in recent years has it been changed for the last 30 or 40 years that they began to call it a mental illness. That puts a stigma with it so that people are afraid, especially if you're a celebrity or someone who's well known, to come out publicly and say, I suffer from depression, therefore I'm mentally ill because it wasn't that long ago that we had such bad words, thoughtless words for people who are mentally ill and where they went That's to, you true. know, the mad house, the not house, crazy, etc. And so I would like to say, hey, look, if you're suffering from depression, you're quite sane. It makes sense that you're depressed. There's a lot of things to be depressed about, but one thing the Bible points to is that brings depression on almost everybody, and that's a continual fear of death. The Bible says in the book of Hebrews, for as much as you and I are made of flesh and blood, God became flesh and blood so he could pass through death and destroy him that had the power of death and deliver those who through the fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. And so that's the, the reality of death and the futility of life and the purposelessness of a godless existence a justified reason for being depressed. In our movie Exit, we cite a lot of people who are very well known that suffer from terrible yes, depression. Yes, you did. They can't even diagnose yes. themselves. Folks, you can watch this film that Ray Comfort has made, The Exit Movie. You can find that and a lot more information at livingwaters.com. Livingwaters.com is short. I think it's less than 45 minutes. It's thought-provoking. And Ray, you suggest that, and I couldn't agree with you more, that everyone sort of inside is saying, I have a will to live. It's a sort of a God-given motivation that he's given us, which is, I don't want to die. I really want to live. It's an instinct you feel God's given us. I couldn't agree with you more. And it has sort of, he's created eternity in our hearts. Uh, I really resonated with that. And then I also resonated with all of the young people you interviewed. Let me just play a real short clip of some of these young people that you're quizzing, you're interviewing. I think that they're response and they are so open with you Ray they're just you ask them a question and they just tell you you know what life hasn't gone very well for me therefore I want the exit do you ever think about suicide yes what causes your depression I think about a lot of stuff I overthink so what do you think about um I don't know I dropped out of school I don't have my dad do you ever think about suicide yeah I tried it before what did you do uh I took pills I tried to like shoot myself and I try to hang myself. 
at three different occasions? Six different occasions. No, I just don't think life is generally worth living, so... You ever consider suicide? Yes, all the time. Isn't that scary? Um, I suppose. But you get kind of used to it after a while. There was such an epidemic that psychologists reclassified depression as a mental disease. And this paved the way for antidepressants. While many say that these have been helpful in treating their depression, antidepressants remain controversial because they sometimes come with horrific side effects. I don't look like I usually look. My hands shake real bad. Medication, nothing I can do about it. And my face, I feel like a balloon. My face is all swollen because of the medication. Ray, again, we're talking medication here, and I think that's a double-edged sword because it really does help a lot of people, and then as you bring out in this little clip here, it's got its devastating side effects as well. Sometimes watch television and can't believe the advertisements they have where they say, look, we've got a, a, a drug here that will help your headaches. Uh, your ears will fall off, you go blind, and you, you'll be paralyzed for life, but it really helps yeah. your headaches. <laughs> the side effects of modern drugs are, are horrific, and um, I'm not anti-doctor, but I think uh, we, we ought to weigh up these things. I I think drugs are filled in with a straitjacket left off years ago when someone they considered to be mentally ill, they put them in a straitjacket. Nowadays, they put them in a straitjacket through medication. So I think if anyone is suffering to, from depression, there are other ways. You know, as I mentioned before, I suffer, suffer from depression, but as a Christian, we have the promise of Romans 8.28 that all things are working together for good to those that love God and accord according to his purpose. So when something rotten happens to me, I allow it to draw me closer to God. And even if I do get depressed, I don't think of suicide. It's not an option for mm-hmm. me because I'm a Christian and I know that God frowns upon it. Paul and Silas were in jail, in the Philippian jail. It was midnight and there was an earthquake around midnight in the darkness of the midnight hour and their chains fell off and the doors are open and that's a picture of the gospel. When Jesus died on the cross there was an earthquake and our chains fell off and the door of heaven was open. The, the chains of sin and death fell off. And so we can be like Paul and Silas in that prison and sing hymns to God, sing praises to God, even though they were going through such a justifiably depressing time. And what happens when you do that, when you stand in Romans 8:28, you can say, Lord, I trust you in this. All things are working together for my good, and therefore I won't consider suicide because you're working in my life. And, and, and that's the, the great consolation and the comfort every Christian has. And every non-Christian should, should look to that for that aspect. You're listening to Understanding the Times Radio. I'm Jan Marquez. Hill, I have on the line Ray Comfort because I've just viewed his incredible film on suicide, to be honest, because it's a rising, growing problem. You can watch it at uh, livingwaters.com, livingwaters.com, and I uh, have Ray on the line here from California. Ray, uh, let me just read two paragraphs from Christianity Today. With rising teen suicides, the church cannot afford mixed messages on mental health. The article, a couple of paragraphs here, a 2014 study, more than 3 million adolescents in the U.S. had a major depressive episode in the past year, and yet most schools and most communities remain unprepared to address the challenges they are facing. Given these statistics, our country's youth face a major mental health crisis, one that the church and its pro-life mission need to confront urgently and compassionately. And then a couple more lines here. Yet for many, the stigma of this remains, and those in the church with diagnoses offers often suffer in silence, having heard that the joy of the Lord is their strength, or they need only to pray more more, to be more healed, or that happiness will accompany the faithful. Many who suffer from depression and related illnesses keep their diagnoses a shameful secret. And then it concludes, the seemingly rigid legalism of some Christians conveys a sense that we need to be perfect, almost without sin, to be part of a Christian community. It's not surprising that a simple Google search of being perfect as a Christian yields over five million sources, though we acknowledge our imperfections perfection as followers of Christ, we also hear that those with faith will not struggle, or assuredly, they will not mention their struggles in their churches, which is kind of how I opened this segment, and that is how the churches are letting so many people down. Uh, but again, your thoughts on this particular CT article? Well, many of the churches don't know how to handle it. It's a yeah. very, very difficult situation, especially when someone says, I'm a Christian, but I suffer from depression and I have suicidal thoughts. And I mentioned before, 
Philip Philippi yeah. in jail. Remember what happened when uh, the doors were open and, and all the prisoners were gone? So the Philippian jailer thought, and he got out a sword to kill himself. He was going to commit suicide because he was in a terrible dilemma. There was no way of escape because under Roman law, if you as a prison guard lost your prisoner, you suffered from his, uh, his execution. Whatever was going to happen to him the next day, that was going to happen to you. And all his prisoners were gone, so he thought. But God had done a miracle. Even though the doors were open, all the prisoners were there. He was mistaken. Mm -hmm. And that's the issue at hand. We've got to remember that God can do a miracle. And when you're a Christian or a non-Christian, don't discount the miracle workings of God. Moses at the Red Sea, no way of escape, but God did a miracle, opens up. Daniel in the lion's den, there was no way of escape, depressing, might as well commit suicide before the lions get, you know, God shut their mouths. So when you take your life, when you commit suicide, you're discounting the miracle working of God in your life. So if you're ever considering suicide, just say, Lord, I trust you in this. This is a dilemma. This is a Red Sea. This is a lion's den. I see no way of escape, but I look to you because you're a miracle working God. And some nowadays discount the miracles of God, but everything around us is a miracle. A baby being born is a miracle. Mm -hmm. A rose is a miracle. Every, the genius of God's creative hand is all around us, and he can take a situation that may seem to you to be an absolute dead end and find a way out for you. So never, ever consider suicide. Just consider trusting God, mm -hmm. even though you're depressed. It's not the absolute answer of depression, it may be still stuck with your depression. You're still stuck in the in the lion's den, but God stops the mouth. Still stuck at the Red Sea, but God opens it up. So just never ever consider taking your own life. Just consider trusting God. You know, you you said just a couple of minutes ago that uh, our times are depressing. I mean, our headlines are depressing, Ray. Just about everything we turn on on the media has some sort of a depressing tone to it. I mean, we're in the perilous times the Bible predicted. It's just very very difficult to go through a day without seeing something or hearing something that a very average person who's not even prone to depression, it gets them down. I hear about it every day. I get their emails every day. And as a matter of fact, a number of people are writing me saying, you know what? I'm tuning out. I'm turning the computer off. I'm turning the TV off. I can't take it anymore. Those are pretty healthy people who are writing like that. I think they're making a wise decision. You know, we've got to remember the news media believes if it bleeds, it bleeds. Yeah, leads. exactly. And so they deliberately put on things that are that are uh, uh, dramatic and depressing and horrible because, well, who wants to sit and watch good news? And so it's very important that you that you do consider the book of Philippians, which says, what sort of things are pure of good report? Think on these things because there's so much negative stuff, but there are good things out there. And soak your soul in the Psalms, soak your soul in the promises of God, and it will lift you up and strengthen you. Because uh, even though there are depressing things happening in life, you don't have to bury your head in them. I, I don't recall if in the film you go into the Netflix little series that they had. I want to talk to you about that for a few minutes. Matter of fact, why don't you clarify exactly what Netflix did very recently and then the kind of result that had. Yeah, they, I've forgotten the name of the uh, actual thing uh, they put on, but it was a, a, a series of programs about a young lady who uh, committed suicide, but before she did, she sent 15 or 13, uh, it's called, that's it, 13 Reasons Why. She sent 13 audio tapes to her so-called friends saying, you're one of the reasons I committed suicide. You know, you raped me, you belittled me, you did this, and then she killed herself. And I, I because we were making this movie on Exit, I made myself watch the suicide scene in the series on Netflix. Uh, you can see it on YouTube, and it, and it showed this young lady, fully clothed, get into a bath and then slit her wrists three inches long ways in the wrist with a razor blade. And it was horrific. You hear her hyperventilating, just going, <sighs> and she did it. And I, I know what special effects are. I know how they did it, but it sent me into hyperventilation. It was so horrific. And you hear her mum call out from the bathroom door, honey, you okay in there? There's water coming out from under the door. And then they open the door and see their daughter in this pool of water that's just crimson with blood. And I think the, the people that produced it made a terrible mistake. And number one is they show the heroine committing suicide, and that's going to get copycats. And, and number two, they forgot about cutters. Out yes. of society, there are people who cut themselves with razor blades. They cut their wrists, they cut their legs, just superficially into their skin. Well, one of the most, I think, profound things in our movie is where a young lady says, after I say to her, when she's having suicidal thoughts in the time, at the t all the time, I said, isn't it depressing? She says, no, you get used to it. 
And cutters are getting used to it. People uh, who cut themselves, the thought of you and I putting a razor blade into our wrists and sliding it down three inches and letting blood come out is horrific. We'd never think of it, but cutters will think of it. And so uh, they are vulnerable people within society, and, and I think they've made a terrible mistake. And this is where the church really needs to step up. We have a glorious gospel. We have the promise of God for everlasting life. I mean, that, that lifts me out of my depression to know that my sins are forgiven, that I've got everlasting life, not as some sort of ghost on a playing a rusty harp for eternity but as christians we're going to inherit this earth i've got a brand new body the lion is going to lie down with a with a lamb or the wolf or the lamb no more pain suffering death decay disease dandruff or dentists all these things are going to be things of the past so as christians we have a glorious hope of the gospel you know jan i think we're going to see more and more people considering suicide and it's because in the 1950s, there were relatively few suicides, and that's because so many people believed in God in the 1950s and the Ten, and the Ten Commandments. Cecil B. DeMille's film, The Ten Commandments, was kind of the Star Wars of the 1950s. Ninety-nine percent of people believed in the existence of God during that time, according to Time magazine. And yet we have seen a revival of atheism, and so we have a generation who don't respect the Ten Commandments. They don't say, thou shalt not kill, and believe that includes suicide. Not only that, because they've forsaken God and reject Christianity, they have no hope of eternity so they live a purposeless hopeless existence and when the honeymoon with sin is over and the storms of life come they're going to find their houses are built on sand and they're going to consider suicide which they are doing right. they don't have that restraint because of their belief in God's existence and in a hope of the future so but now more than ever before we need to share movies like Exit and we need to step up with the gospel because when I became a Christian the second I became a Christian I became pro-life I became one, man, uh, one woman in marriage. I believed life uh, had purpose and existence in a split second because I was born again and given a new heart with new desires. And that's what this country needs. It needs the glorious gospel to transform the heart of this nation by the power of God. We're going to wrap up our interview with Ray Comfort after I take a real short time out. Just let me quickly say, Ray, that uh, the suicide-related searches spiked 19% after the 13 Reasons Why premiere on Netflix. I wasn't aware of this until I did a little research on it. The Netflix Netflix show follows high school student Hannah through a series of tapes to explain why she killed herself. My goodness. That's what I'm saying when I say people are writing me saying they're turning the media off and even their computer because enough. It's it's too dark and uh, it's caused them to feel dark and desperate instead of uh, wanting to look up knowing our Redeemer is drawing near. I'm coming back in just a couple of minutes. We'll wrap this up with Ray Comfort talking about his film, which you can find a lot more information about at livingwaters.com, livingwaters.com. Just a reminder, Olive Tree Ministries does not carry Ray Comfort's new DVD project. However, you can order Ray's new video on suicide, title Exit, at Amazon.com. Or you can watch the video, Exit, online, or order it from Ray's own website, livingwaters.com. In just a moment, we'll return to Jan's discussion today with Ray Comfort. Don't forget, video and audio recordings of our most recent Understanding the Times conference are now available. Those October 7 conference memories can be ordered in either a DVD or CD format when you visit olivetreeviews.org or phone 763-559-4444. You can help support this radio outreach when you send your tax-deductible donations to Olive Tree Ministries, Post Office Box 1452, Maple Grove, Minnesota, 55311. More from Ray Comfort coming right up. Please stay with us. Thanks for standing with this radio outreach, both prayerfully and financially, for 17 years. I have always tried to give you the good news amidst the troubling headlines that we read daily. The Bible says that without hope, the people perish. Well, there is hope today, but that is rooted in the message of the Bible. The King is coming. If you are ready to meet him, then be encouraged. But would you keep this message on air in our over 800 radio markets with a year-end gift online at olivetreeviews.org or call us at 763-559-4444, 763-559-4444. You can drop us a tax-deductible gift to Olive Tree Ministries, Box 1452, Maple Grove, Minnesota, 55311, Box 1452, Maple Grove, Minnesota, 55311. We want to equip you for today and tomorrow. We want to provide news, views, and truths, but more than that, make sure you are ready to meet the King. 
The National Center for Health Statistics released data on Friday showing an increase in the suicide rate amongst females and males in every age group under 75. While researchers expected to see an increase in suicides among middle-aged Americans, they did not anticipate such a sharp rise among 10 to 14-year-old children. In total, 425 children between the ages of 10 and 14 died by suicide in 2014. Filmmaker, evangelist, and apologist Ray Comfort is Jan's special guest on today's Understanding the Times. Here again with Ray, Jan Martell. What's alarming is that the depression has resulted in an epidemic of suicides. Nearly half a million Americans are taken to the hospital every year because of suicide attempts. Back in 2013, Newsweek magazine addressed the epidemic and could give no reason for the increase saying that it had nothing to do with unemployment and nothing to do with guns. They said, This year, America is likely to reach a grim milestone, the 40,000th death by suicide, the highest annual total on record. According to the World Health Organization, a massive 350 million people suffer from depression. Perhaps you could move to Denmark, listed by the United Nations as the happiest country in the world. Before you make a decision to move, listen to this. You can say we are the happiest country in the world. I like to say we're the least unhappy. The country has the highest cancer rate in the world. Large portions of the population also suffer from alcoholism and depression. And that's what's so frustrating about depression, because you don't know where it comes from. You know, you can't explain it. Do you ever consider suicide? I have, yeah. I actually tried attempting it a few times when I was a teenager. I'm 23 now. Did you ever have suicidal thoughts? Yes, frequently. Did you ever attempt to commit suicide? I did once. What happened? It was halfway through. It's just like I just realized I didn't want to do it. Don't forget, this program is always posted to my website, Saturday morning, olivetreeviews.org. I'm spending these two segments talking to Ray Comfort because I have been very moved by one of his films, most recent one, titled The Exit. Now you can find more at livingwaters.com. You can watch it at livingwaters.com. And I recommend you do. You may sound, Jan, this is really gloom and doom. Unfortunately, you may think that, but millions and millions of people are struggling. I have an article in front of me. It's a clipping from, again, Christianity Today. I'm glad they're tackling this. One in three Protestant churchgoers personally affected by suicide. One in three Protestant churchgoers personally affected by suicide. goes on to say, eight in ten Protestant senior pastors believe their church is equipped to intervene with someone who is threatening suicide. Yet few people turn to the church for help before taking their own lives. We've already discussed that. Ray Comfort, let me come back to you, and I want to ask you a couple of questions here as we wrap things up here. You make a biblical argument against taking one's own life, and I think we need to hit on that before time gets away here, because I think even as we're speaking, there are some, and they are probably believers, who are entertaining the idea of suicide. Give me the biblical argument against this. And you've touched on it, by the way, but I want you to emphasize it. Yeah, I, I think, number one, scriptures say very clearly, you shall not kill. It's God's prerogative to take life. Remember in the book of Job, Job just said, God, kill me, kill me, God, kill me. I'm so depressed. Things are so rotten. The circumstances are so horrible. But he never once considered taking his own life. Why? Because he feared God. And, you know, the fear of the Lord is probably most despised doctrine in modern day America, both within the church and outside the church. You shouldn't fear God. He's your buddy. He's your friend. Well, that's not according to the Bible. God is to be feared, and the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And if you fear God, you put him above your own desires. And I touched on before the yeah. Philippian jailer was going to really? kill himself because he was in a situation that seemed hopeless. But God, when he intervenes, takes hopelessness and gives hope. And so if you inject God in your situation and you stand on Romans 8.28 and you get right with God yourself, you turn from sin and trust in the Savior, then all things will work together for your good. Even the darkness you're going through now, God promises to take you through into the light. So very important. You know, uh, Oswald Chambers, that great writer, suffered from depression. So did Charles Spurgeon. So did Martin Luther. Spurgeon said, I pity a dog who has to suffer what I have had. He said, some are touched 
with melancholy from their birth. But listen to what he also said. Living in an unbroken series of summer days where no cold mists are dreamed of, it is no great marvel that rheumatic pains fly away and depression of spirit departs. So Spurgeon was actually saying some of the depression we're in is circumstantial. Living in London where it was always misty and mm. foggy made him depressed. So he'd go across to the French Riviera and those bright blue skies helped his depression. So sometimes we're born melancholy and we just that's the way we are. Other times it's circumstantial. But we should never ever lose hope because when we inject God into the situation he can do the supernatural and give hope to the hopeless and so if you forsake God in that you're going to be left in hopelessness but if you inject them then you've always got that hope. You have some closing thoughts you've touched on some of these closing thoughts that you have as you wrap up the film. Again folks you can watch it at livingwaters.com and particularly if you have a loved one in your life who's uh, suffered from depression if you're suffering from depression I can't strongly enough encourage you to go to Living Waters com and watch this very short film, um, but it's so insightful. Ray, how, how did you get these, I mean, these young people that you interviewed, and they were heavily young people, they just so freely <laughs> shared with you the bluntness of what they'd been thinking, what they'd been doing, that some, one young man, six attempts at suicide. What is it about you that brings this out in people? Must be my accent, I guess. Could I be. don't know. I, I prayed beforehand. Yeah. I said, Lord, I need young people that will open up about suicide, and three or four people did immediately after that as I filmed them, but you know, we produced a book. It's a very small book, and we make it available very low cost and bulk price. It's called How to Battle Depression and Suicidal Thoughts. And it opens with a very interesting anecdote, and I'll just like to share it with you Please. because it's so powerful. This young man is, is going to walk across the bridge. A stranger is going to walk across the Golden Great Bridge, and he sees the young man who's going to take his life. He's sitting on the edge of the bridge. He calls out, don't do it, don't do it. And he says, I'm going to jump. You can't stop me. I've made my mind up. He said, well, if you're going to jump anyway, let me tell you about my friend's brother. And so the guy who's sitting on the edge of the bridge says, tell me about your stupid friend's brother. I'm going to jump anyway. So he said, look, the stranger said, this happened in Utah in 2012. He said, my brother was taken by a group of masked men with knives and they knocked him out. They cut open his chest and cut out his heart and no one did a thing to stop them. And the young guy sitting on the edge of the a bridge says, that's disgusting, that's evil, that makes me want to jump, that's, that's the sort of thing that, that causes my depression, that was evil. And the, the stranger said, no, it wasn't, it was good. And the guy says, what are you talking about? He says, well, those men that took my brother were surgeons. The knives they had were scalpels, and the, they had masks on, and they knocked him out with anesthesia, and they took out his bad heart and gave him a good heart. And the young man sitting there says, oh... And the stranger says, oh, indeed. He said, you just changed your mind from something being evil to being good in a matter of seconds because I gave you information. He said, I've got information that's going to change your mind about jumping. And all I want you to do is listen because it will change your mind. And then a discourse begins between the two of them where the young man, after a, some time, reaches up his hand. He says, will you take my hand and lift me out of this place? Because he was given information that he didn't have. And that's what people that are suffering from suicide, that's the dilemma. They're in, they don't have the information they need that will change the paradigm that will do a paradigm shift and change their attitude and so uh, that's why we want people to watch the film even though it's a distasteful subject and get the book and give it out to people because one of the scariest signs that someone's suicidal is that there's no signs you know you can have someone that's just bouncing along and enjoying life and they kill themselves and you didn't realize what was deep within their thoughts and so we want to prevent people from committing suicide and, and do something to stop this terror within our nation okay so the book how to battle depression and suicidal thoughts that's only a available at livingwaters.com. Is that right? It's available at Amazon, too. You can get it through there, and it's a, it's just a very small book, very easy read, and it's written in a New Zealand accent. <laughs> That's great. Okay, you can't call us, folks. you you got to go to uh, livingwaters.com or amazon.com, and I would recommend it because it's a very short book, and I think you combine the book with this little film, and Ray, can they, they can order the film and watch it just via their DVD player, correct? Yeah, they can order it on DVD, or they can watch it freely on YouTube also. Yeah, so, yeah. So for folks who may not be the most computer literate, uh, it'd be best if they perhaps ordered the DVD. And is that best purchased then through livingwaters.com? That's right, yes. Okay, folks, we're not giving out phone numbers right now, so you can find someone with a computer perhaps to help you with it. Ray, uh, you've got another film coming up. I want to give you just a few minutes here to talk about it because we're heading into Christmas season. Why have you targeted it, this, this newest film coming out shortly? Why have you targeted Christmas? I've seen it online, by the way. I realize it's a great witnessing opportunity, but uh, talk, talk to me about it here for a couple minutes. Yeah, it's called Christmas Gone Viral. We're going to release the movie on livingwaters.com in the very near future in the next week or so. 
so. It's because one third of the world celebrates Christmas. Yes. You know, when Paul stood up in Athens, he noticed the whole of Athens was given to idolatry, but he didn't preach against their idolatry. He actually quoted Greek poets. You think, what did he do that for? Well, he wanted to relate to his hearers. He wanted a springboard to take the gospel to them, and quoting Greek poets was a way to relate. Well, with one third of the world, that's two billion people celebrating Christmas, there is the ultimate springboard of the gospel. They are celebrating the birth of Jesus. So we made a movie where I sent different people from different countries out with their cameras onto the streets to use Christmas as a springboard. And so you see about six or seven different countries, the different people and, and accents, it's quite delightful. Yeah. Say, do you celebrate Christmas? They say, yeah. I say, do you know whose birthday it is? Yes. Do you know what Jesus came to do? And they say, no, not really. And so the gospel gets explained because of this wonderful opening called Christmas. And so we want people to use this. It's going to be uh, broadcast on uh, a national television program to, I think, to 190 countries, should I say. Really? And mid-December, but it's going to be released before that. And it's the sort of thing you can give to relatives and say, please watch this. It'll give you a different perspective on Christmas. Why don't we wrap this up, Ray? Because I appreciated the closing thoughts that I heard from you, particularly in the little film we're talking about. And again, find it uh, a little film film on suicide, folks, at livingwaters.com. But I appreciated the way you wrapped it up because none of us are a cosmic accident. And quite frankly, that's what a lot of people who are thinking about taking their own lives are thinking is that they perhaps that they have no worth, or at least very little worth, and yet we are handcrafted by the Creator. We're formed in the image of God. We have great value placed on us as a result, and there actually is hope, there's meaning, there's purpose, and there's actually help available for anybody who's struggling right now. Yes, in Switzerland, there's a village that's surrounded by big mountains, and it's in darkness for most of the year, I think eight or nine months of the year, total shadow. And what someone did is they had a great idea. They put a huge mirror on a mountain, and it reflected the sun right into the heart of that village, so people in the darkness can go and stand in the warmth of that and light of the sunshine and that's what the gospel is in this dark world to them that sat in the shadow of death a light has sprung up jesus said i'm the light of the world he that follows me shall not walk in darkness but shall have the light of life so the gospel is the only hope for humanity it gives purpose it gives reason to exist and in the cross god revealed his love for us so uh, as christians we need to uphold that gospel and take it to those who sit in the shadow of death Rick Comfort, thanks for all you do. It's tremendously appreciated by those of us, particularly uh, in ministry, because you're you're kind of a spokesman for us with the various products you produce, particularly your videos. And I, I thank you for making them. I thank you for making the, this incredible one on, on suicide. I mean, it's needed, very much needed. We'll stay in touch, my friend. Thank you again. Okay, thank you, Janet. God bless. Yeah, bye now. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Folks, I want to thank you for listening, and we'll talk to you next week. Thanks for joining us for today's Understanding the Times Radio with Jen Markell. Across America and across the World Wide Web, we continue to report current events from a biblical perspective. Every week, this broadcast comes to you at no cost, but it costs us thousands of dollars. As we produce and distribute this weekend media outreach, would you consider becoming our partner? With an ever-changing world, men and women of faith need to keep informed. They need to be aware of current events as viewed through the lens of Scripture. Week after week, Jan Markell brings you a compelling hour of discussion to point out the dangers in today's culture and to bring hope through faith in Jesus Christ. Do consider joining us in this listener-supported ministry as our financial partner. Please write with your tax-deductible gifts to Olive Tree Ministries, Post Office Box 1452, Maple Grove, Minnesota, 55311. Contributions are also accepted at olivetreeviews.org or by phone when you call 763-559-4444. Don't forget, global updates with a biblical worldview are yours around the clock at olivetreeviews.org. We look forward to hearing from you very soon. We appreciate your continued prayer support for Jan and her media team. Next week, Jan Markell returns with another information and inspiration-packed hour designed to help you understand the times.